You are welcome to this overview of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verse 36, through chapter 8, verse 25. Messiah astonishes everyone. We are still in the fourth section of the ninefold structure of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' mission, Messiah's message and work. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Pharisees were the respectable religious conservatives of their day, many of whom were sincere seekers after truth. It was also a religious duty to provide meals for visiting teachers who came to local synagogues. Why did they recline at table? In wealthy homes, guests lay on couches around a low table, facing their host with their feet towards a wall. How did that woman get into the house? It was customary at formal dinners to allow community members to come listen to conversations with important guests. And what was an alabaster jar of perfume for? Alabaster, a soft stone, was used to make jars or bottles to preserve perfumes and resins for months or for years. More about this later. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. In their hard way of life, some women carried a small bottle in which they caught and preserved their tears whilst weeping because of hard work, poor health, harsh treatment, child mortality, widowhood, or poverty. This jar is said to contain myrrh, a gum resin extracted from a number of small thorny tree species of the genus Camifora. Myrrh resin has been used throughout history as a perfume, incense, and medicine. Myrrh, mixed with posca, or wine, was widely used in many ancient cultures to produce pleasurable feelings and as an anti-inflammatory and analgesic. Pasca is a mixture of water, vinegar, and wine. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Uh, tell me, teacher. Now, a word about prophets. Most Jews recognize that no genuine prophet had risen in Israel since the time of Malachi. In pagan societies, prophets include soothsayers, those who attempt to read the future, philosophers, and poets. The Hebrew prophets, however, were reliable seers who receive and deliver messages and miracles from God. In popular usage, a prophet is anyone who can reveal secrets. In the Christian church, prophets are fallible foretellers and foretellers animated by the Holy Spirit. But we're also plagued with charlatans. These are platform-based performers who say whatever comes to mind in a loud or falsetto voice. So Jesus continued, Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50 Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Linguists point out that there is no term in Aramaic language 
for gratitude, so they used the term love. Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. On the forgiveness of debts, although debts were to be forgiven in the seventh year, experts in the law had found ways to get around that requirement. Creditors could have debtors imprisoned, temporarily enslaved, or have certain goods confiscated. But this creditor goes beyond the letter of the law and extends mercy. We recommend the InterVarsity Press Bible Backgrounds Commentary. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned it towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Now, most respectful hosts did provide water for guests to wash their feet upon entering their house because they wore sandals walking on dusty roads. Walking on dusty roads. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. Kissing or embracing cheek to cheek is a formal way for adults to greet one another, as in many parts of Europe to this day. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then said Jesus to her, your sins are forgiven. How could Jesus forgive sins before he died to forgive sins? We recommend that you read Romans 3, verses 24 through 26. Sins were committed before Jesus died, as our atonement in about 33 CE. Humans continue to commit sins even afterwards. It is clear from Scripture that before Jesus came, God did indeed forgive sins, and that he continues to do so afterwards. It is Jesus' blood shed on a wooden cross that provided the basis for God to forgive sins beforehand and continues to be the basis on which God forgives sins to this day. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? So Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Faith has at least three components. First, it means to believe truth. For example, to believe in God. Secondly, it means to trust somebody's promises. In our case, we trust Jesus to save and it includes loyalty to someone, even as we remain faithful to Jesus at all costs. There are also different levels of intensity of faith. Everyone in every society has a worldview, basic assumptions about reality that they seldom question. Every society also offers official doctrines derived from authority figures. We also employ logic based on presuppositions, and, and we may seek evidence from which to draw logical deductions. We may perform experiments seeking credible proofs. In an emergency, we will accept almost any practical help, but we are more deliberate about making commitments, that is, putting personal trust in someone else, though there are those who, by complete abandonment, risk everything to follow a leader. Now, everybody has a worldview. Religions offer authority. Philosophers prefer logic. Scientists seek evidence. Seekers and researchers may perform experiments or read reports. 
When we are desperate, we will accept almost any practical help. Evangelicals talk a lot about putting personal trust in Christ, but more radical Christians will abandon all to obey Jesus at any cost. And then there are the directions of faith. Faith may look backwards for reasons to believe, or may look inwards to the subject of faith. How strongly do I believe or trust? But then we may look at the object of faith. Was this woman saved because of her reasons, or the intensity of her faith, or because of whom she believed? One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake, so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. A squall is an intense wind that stirs up waves of water. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? he asked his disciples. So Jesus returns to the theme of faith. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Now, nearly everyone in the world has an opinion about who Jesus is. Atheists will tell you, well, he's nobody, for he never existed. A faith statement, if there ever was one. A New Age practitioner may glibly state, oh, well, Jesus was one of the great masters. Cult members will very definitely make the claim that Jesus was the angel Michael appearing to be human. In Islam, Jesus becomes a dead secondary prophet. In academia, your children in college will be taught that he was an itinerant Jewish rabbi. Your Mormon neighbors believe that he was a created man who has since become a god, even as they seek to become gods. These miracles that Jesus did, what did they show? The healing of diseases, for example, demonstrated divine mercy and divine power. When he expelled evil spirits, again he showed his mercy and divine authority. When he occasionally revived the dead, he extended mercy, proving to be a life source. When he commanded nature, he demonstrated deity. When he multiplied food, again he showed mercy with creative power. When he told Peter to go fishing and found a coin in the fish's mouth with which to pay taxes, Jesus had arranged a coincidence. But then, when he rose from the dead, never to die again, he employed his creative power. On another hand, Jesus never operated magical tricks or illusions, nor did he make living creatures pulling bunnies from hats. If you are meeting in a group, then discuss together what truths will you affirm from this passage? What promises will you claim? What commands will you obey? Your assignment for next time is to read Luke 8.26-9.9 through 9, 9 in different translations. Visit the website for other resources and compile your own insights, queries, and observations to share with others.